Thank you. Tonight, subject is have you funding? If I told you that you and I and the whole vast world are looking for the same thing, would you believe it? You might think you're looking for money or power or fame or health or unnumbered things. But I am telling you, you and I, in the whole vast world, are in search of the same thing. We are looking for our son. Everyone is looking for the son that is dead. Now, this story is told us in Scripture. It's Adam Brady. You'll turn to the 18th chapter of Second Samuel. And the messenger comes bringing the news to the king, for the king is David. And David meets the messenger, the Cushite, and he says, Is it well with the young man Absalom? Well, Absalom, if you break the word up, Abi's father, some call it Abi, which means my father, and Sholem is peace. So this is simply the father's peace. Well, here, is it well with the young man, Absalom? And the Cushite answered, May the enemy of my lord the king, and those who would rise up against you for evil, be like that young man. In other words, he's dead. And then David broke into weeping. And David wept. And then the most poignant word possibly recorded. Oh, my son, my son. Absalom, my son, my son. Would I have died instead of this? If he only could have died, instead of his son. But what man who has lost a child wouldn't feel that? He is older, and why should the child go before the parent? And any parent worthy of the name would like to feel that if I could only have substituted and given myself in place of the one that is gone. And so he would willingly have died instead of his son. But he couldn't do it. That's an adumbration. And now we find that God, the Father, does it for his son. Unless I die, thou canst not live. But if I die, I shall arise again, and thou with me. So God dies. Act he does. And in dying, at the fullness of time, he resurrects his son. So the son is dead and buried. Where did they bury the son? They buried him in the city of David. For the city of David is called Jerusalem. It's called Zion. It's called Bethlehem. These are all synonymous terms. All buried in the one place. And that one person who is buried there is the son, the son David. Now God dies and becomes buried in the city of David. The city of David is your own wonderful star. That's where God is buried. There he is buried and there he is looking and eagerly seeking for his son. One day, by his own place, he will rise, and rising, he will bring with him his son. Unless I die, thou canst not live. But if I die, I shall arise again, and you with me. So the story is the story of every person in the world. You do not know who you are. I'll tell you who you are. You are God. You are God who died and who came down into the world of death 
But in the present state of your forgetfulness, not knowing who you are, you are in scripture the insane soul. You are that first king of Israel, so, and you are insane, you do not know who you are. And your son could stand before you, and you suffering from amnesia, do not recognize him. Until you know him, you do not know who you are. For it takes the son to reveal the father. For no one knows who the son is except the father. And no one knows who the father is except the son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So the Son could stand before you. And if you're still in the state of amnesia, you cannot recognize your own Son. Now here in Scripture, we are told that Philip said to his friend Nathaniel, I have come him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus. Yet the same Philip, later on as the drama unfolds, the same Philip is saying, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. He said, I have been so long with you, and yet you do not know me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. How then can you say, show us the Father? So his claim in the beginning, that I have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, was not altogether true. He found him possibly by the search of scripture, but he hadn't found him, or he could not have asked the question, show us the Father. For if you ever see the Son knowing the Son, you know the Father, because you are the Father. He could not have found the Son and then ask the question to be shown the Father. Now, who is this son of Scripture? Let us go back into the Bible. In the 40th Psalm, which is written by David, it's called the Psalm of David. In the roll of the book, it is written of me. Now, search the Scriptures, it's all about me, the Son of God. Are you the Son of God? Yet I will tell you of the decree of the Lord. He said unto me, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten him. So in the volume of the book, it is all about me. And the Father is the Lord. The Father is God. Now David died, we are told, and he was buried in the city of David. There was no way of raising David, but he was promised that he would not be left in hell. And then David could say, Thou hast redeemed me, thou hast delivered my soul from death. Into thy hand, said he in his 31st Psalm, I deliver my spirit. I actually relinquish it. Into thy hand I relinquish my spirit. Then he said, Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. This is our search. This mystery is not something to be kept secret, but it is a truth that is mysterious in character. Did it hear when you think, I must pay rent, and I must have more money to do the things I must do. I must pay taxes. I must do a number of things. And you think, that is your goal. That is your drive. And the whole vast world, you ask them tonight, what do you want? But one would say, I want to get married more than anything else in the world. That's the drive. Another one, but I want to become a mother. Another one, I want money. I want fame. And you name it, it's right there. And all these are the by things. It is not the goal of God. Because man doesn't know that he is God. There's only one purpose for the descent to find his son. His son is buried. The son died, and the son is David. The essence of the experience of being humanity, for David is the symbol of humanity. So God becomes man, actually becomes man. To become man, he has to forget that he is God. So he completely forgets that he is God. Therefore, you know, I accept who I am, 
and suffer from complete and total amnesia. I am, as far as the rational mind goes, I am insane. I don't know who I am, that's a form of insanity, that no one can hit me over the head hard enough to bring back memory. No matter what you put before me that is mine, I can't recognize it. So put my son before me and I do not know him. Put my friends before me and I do not know them. And the whole vast thing is simply I don't know it for them. That total amnesia is a form of insanity. Now, one day man will awake. And when he awakes, he will know who he is. He awakes first, that comes first. Listen to the words of the inspired base. Unless I die, thou canst not live. But if I die, I shall arise again and die with me. I rise first. The Father rises first. It comes in that order. And then, 139 days later, the tomb is opened and his son comes out and stands before him. And the son is David. And when the son stands before him, and there is no uncertainty as to this relationship of father-son, then his peace has returned. It's the absolute that has returned. That rebel son of his who tried to destroy his father and take over the kingdom. And yet the love of the father for the son, in spite of his rebellious nature, was so great that he died to save his son. This is the mystery of Scripture. Every one of you, and every child born of woman, is going to have this experience. And in the end, we all go back. And we, the brothers, who together form the fatherhood. For the fatherhood is Elohim. And Elohim is the compound word. It is one made up of many, one made up of others. It's a compound unity. So Elohim, which is translated in scripture God. We are the God, but here we are the brotherhood, but we do not know it. We fight each other. We kill each other. We do all kinds of things to each other because we do not know that we are the God who came down in search of our son. And I'll go back with full consciousness of who I am, having found him. You will come back with the full consciousness of who you are having something. You'll find the same son, and you are the same God, without any loss of identity. You, know, you are identified and you are completely individualized forever and forever. Yet, you are the father of my son. Forget your sex. This has nothing to do with sex as we understand it on this level. We are in the resurrection above the organization of sex. For in him there is no Greek, no Jew, no bond, no free, no male, no female, just one. So in this one awakening being, we are only God. And the being that reveals us is our son, and his name is David. So have you found him? Only you will know. I can tell you about him. I can take you all the way through Scripture and show you where David, all the way through. So if Moses in the law and all the prophets wrote of me, says he, for in the volume of the book, it is all about me. Every word about it, it is all about me. But who wrote the word? David. Go search the Scripture to see if you can find him. And then you come into the New Testament and who found him? That I have found David, says he, because David in the spirit called me my Lord. Now that's the story of Christianity. The fulfillment, the climax of the entire thing is found in the story of Jesus Christ. Because in the spirit, David called him Father. He called him my Lord. And the story is being told, and man takes Jesus Christ as the Son. Jesus is the Father. And everyone must experience the story of Jesus. Because Jesus in man, Christ in you, is the hope of God. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Well, if he is in me, why is he in me? And what is his purpose? He is looking for the Son. 
So if it once happens, then it continues to happen forever and forever and forever until all find the sun. Only as you find the sun do you know who you are. So the question is, have you found him? One said, I have found him. I have found him where? I have found him in one known as Jesus. And he was the one mentioned by the law, the lawgiver. For Moses in the law and the prophets wrote of him. And yet the same one, same Philip, would ask, as the story unfolds, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. For well, if you said you found me prior to this moment, then you didn't find me. You couldn't ask me to show you the Father if you had found me. If you really had found me, you would have done it. For you do not know me. Had you known me, you would have known the Father. And he who sent me is one with the one that he sent. He never left me, the sender and the sender one. So I sent myself. You sent yourself into the world. We came down into this world for a purpose. The fantastic purpose of discovering and finding our son. So the great poet, they're the ones who come closest to the great revelation. And here is this wonderful statement of the son. He has the son stand before Saul. For so Saul is a demented king. You are Saul if you haven't found him. Because you've forgotten who you are. And that's the state of amnesia. So he stands before the king. And he said, Oh Saul, a face like my face shall receive you. A man like unto me thou shalt love, and be loved by forever. A hand like this hand shall throw open the gate of new life to thee. See, the Christ stands. For whose words are these? The words of David. He's standing before Saul, and Saul does not recognize him. So Saul's name was then changed from Saul to Paul. And Paul recognized him. But while Paul was still bearing the name of Saul, he heard a voice coming from without that really was whispered from within himself. And the voice said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he answered, Who are you, Lord? He said, Jesus, whom you persecute. He was Saul. Then he changed his name from Saul to Paul. And then Paul had it revealed in him who the son was. At that moment, it pleased the Father to reveal his son in me. And then I conferred not with flesh and blood. What man who had not yet found the son could throw any light on the experience of having found the son? So you found the son. And the most intelligent person in the world can't follow your reasoning because this is all revelation. It's not something that you can actually discover by reason. Revelation is the great truth of scripture, which cannot be logically proven. Now, Saturday night, I was in bed. At 11 o'clock, the phone rang. I got up, answered the phone, and it was a lady. And she said, are you Norvell? I said, no, I am Neville. Well, she said, Neville, Norvell, the same thing. I said, no, we are different teachers. We are different speakers. Well, she said, are you the one who has an ad today, Facebook? I said, well, I think both of us have. I saw his ad, a huge big ad, and he's speaking on Monday night, and I will be speaking on Monday night. But are you the one who has the title call, have you found him? I said, yes. Now you're speaking to Neville. That's my title. Well, she said, what do you mean by it? Well, it's going to take me three quarters of an hour to explain it on Monday night. Well, could you tell me now? I said, no, I'm not giving a lecture tonight. <laughs> Now there am I giving it tonight, but I'm certainly not going to give you a lecture over the telephone. Here is 11 o'clock. The clock was striking 11 when the phone rang. So she's telling me that she wants to hear the lecture over the phone. And then I, I, I didn't know what to do because after all, you're tired, you're sleepy. And here's this voice, and she says, you know, could you give me just the essence of it? I said, well, if I'll give you the essence, we'll be in this. 
Have you found the cause of the phenomena of life? He said to me, why anything? I am a very highly educated person, and that doesn't make any sense to me. You know, I thought I was hearing something out of the, well, some fairy tale. A highly educated person, and when I said it in so simple a manner, have you found the cause of the phenomena of life? The cause of the phenomena, I mean all phenomena, and that is beyond her capacity to grasp it. She tells me she's a very highly educated person. But then it flashed into my mind a little story that I know is fictional, but you see there's no fiction in this world. If a magazine creates reality and you conjure a story, don't think it's going to remain as a story, it's going to become a fact. But across this country, in every city where Norman Vincent Peale visits, he always tells this little story. that I met a great intellectual. And how do you know that I did? He told me that he did. <laughs> well, she tells me that she is among the intelligentsia. How would I know what she told me? And yet she couldn't understand a simple little statement when I said, by have you found him, I mean, have you found the source, the cause of the phenomena of life? For it is really your own wonderful human imagination. Then she hung up. And then I went back to bed. So here I'm telling you, when you find David, you're going to find yourself. And when you find yourself, you're going to discover your all imagination. That's all that you are, your infinite imagination. That imagining creates reality. So everything in this world first was imagined before it became fact. Just like that silly little story that Peel tells just to get a laugh. He gets a huge big audience and he always pulls that little story. Whether it ever happened to him or not, I don't know. But I thought until now it was all fiction. But if you can't have fiction for too long, if imagining creates reality. It starts as fiction, but it becomes fact. And I have the tangible proof last Saturday night. To me, it's a fact. If I told that story from here to the coast, back east, I would not be telling a little fictional story. I'd be actually telling what happened to me last Saturday night. And this one clears, I am a very, very highly educated person. And that means nothing to me. Well, I'm quite sure that anyone out of grammar school speaking for the cause of the same things happening in their world, if I say to them in their own language, but I put it because she is such a wonderful person, I said, all right, have you found the cause of the phenomena of life? Something happened to you today. You expect things to happen tomorrow, and things happened last year. Do you know why they happened? Can you trace the happening, the event, to a source and find that source? Because by him all things were made. I didn't tell her that last night because I wasn't giving a lecture. <laughs> but all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that is made. Well, if that is true, well, then he's responsible for the good and the evil, for everything in this world. Because I actually came into this world, and to do it, I had to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so if anything happens to me that is unlovely, then I did it. If it's lovely, I did it. No matter what happens to me, I did it. But my search here is to find my son. My son came down into the world. And who is my son? He is my power. He is my wisdom. And he thought he could rob me of my estate and completely take from me my kingdom. But I so loved him. And where, how did he die? Read the story. He was found hanging on a tree hanging on the oak tree. And then they took three darts and pierced his heart so that he was sure he was dead. And when they were sure that he was dead, he was a piece of his father. Not a piece, something came out of him. He was the piece, Sholem is the word. You greet in the Hebraic world the Sholem, Sholem Aleichem, peace be unto you. And he was the Sholem of his father, the piece of his father. And then the peace was shattered to his death, he was hanging on a tree. Well, what tree? Well, this is the tree. There is no other tree, no other cross on which Christ is buried. Christ is buried on humanity. 
and here he hangs, and the heart is being pierced. But now the Father will come and will give us. For unless I die, thou canst not live. But if I die, I shall arise again, and thou with me. Wouldst thou now one who never died for thee, or ever die for one who had not died for thee? And if God dieth not for man, and giveth not himself eternally for man, man could not exist. So God dies. God comes down into the world, and takes on the limitation of man to find himself, his son, among man. And one day he finds him. One day the little tomb opens, and he comes out first. And then, five months later, an enormous explosion where his son was buried. And then the son comes out and stands before him. But in this time, he really is victorious because he holds in his hand the head of the giant, the Philistine giant that he brought down. And you, the father, you are so in love with the beauty of your son. So looking at him, and he who called you to weep and to cry out, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son, would I have died instead of thee? And so you die, and up to your death, you raise him up, and he stands before you, your everlasting son. So you kept your promise, your everlasting love to all the horror you had to go to redeem it. And that's what we're doing here now. In spite of all the horror of the world, that's what we're doing. And you'll reach a point in time, I tell you, that you become completely unafraid. Not a thing in this world could move you, for you know who you are. So when I went back to bed on Saturday night, had a sun sung night with lovely teaching and lovely revelation. As I came back, it was five in the morning. And here as I was awakening at five, I heard the clock strike five. And I came from this experience. Now, everything in this world is but a symbol. Everything, no matter what it is, it's a symbol. And it contains within itself the capacity for symbolic significance. So as I returned to the surface of my being, it was with this experience that I just had. I stood in the presence of Stalin. And here was Khrushchev next to me. We were on fire. He was shaking in his boot, for he knew the monster who was going to judge. For no monster in the 20th century ever exceeded the monster that was Stalin. He could rub out, as he did, 40 million with impunity. 40 million with impunity. And he was simply going over all the things he intended to do to me. Khrushchev knew from experience that he had the capacity to injure beyond the wildest dream of man. I knew not from experience, I knew only from hearsay what this monster represented. And as he gloated over his intention, I knew, had no fear whatsoever, I knew that every pronouncement that he made concerning me, his every intention he himself had to express. I stood unmoved, completely unmoved, unafraid, and he felt the first and the pain that went through him. His eyes bowed with pain. And he got madder and madder, and he voiced the second, and it was intensified pain. And I stood completely unmoved before him as he went through, and he had to stop. The pain was so intense that he was causing to himself. I had awakened from the dream of life, and how is on earth is he going to hurt the one who found the son? The father found the son, and the father is the cause of all. And here he is as mad as a hatter, as he was on earth, in the row, but I wasn't the telling, the person. He is a symbol of the most monstrous thing that walked the 20th century. If you mention any one person who represented absolute authority in the 20th century, you would have to mention Stalin. You couldn't mention any little king or queen that ever took a throne. You couldn't mention any other little dictator. They were peanuts compared to this thing. 
Even Hitler, who murdered millions, was not the power that Stalin was. And here, he sat there, gloating as to what he's going to do. And here I am, completely unmoved. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And I stood there, waiting for his intention to be voiced, as he voiced it. And the face that on the pain you can, and may I tell you, the emotion that went through me, pity. No hate whatsoever, I pitied him. Because here is a man putting himself through the tortures of hell, thinking he is hurting another. And there is no other. There is only God. So I stood before him, he could not recognize me, for he hasn't found the Son. When you find the Son, you recognize him. So Philip really did not know that he found him. That I have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote. He could not have found him, or he would not have asked the same one as it progressed. Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. And then comes the rebuke. Have I been so long with you, and yet you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How then can you say, show us the Father? So when you think of Jesus, think of God the Father. And David in the Spirit calls Jesus my Father. He calls him my Lord. The expression of every son of his Father. Either to his face or speaking of him. And so he asks, how can like I be his son? When in the Spirit he calls me my Lord. So when you find David, and you know he is your son, he can stand before you forever. But if you have not yet been turned from Saul into Paul, then you will not know. But when you meet him after the explosion in your own brain, for the whole thing takes place in the brain of man. That's where it takes place. The whole thing is in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem above is the great place where everything takes place. It's called the city of David. It's called Zion. It's called Bethlehem. These are all synonymous terms. So here, within you one day, the drama unfolds. And you know exactly who you are. The immortal God that you are. I tell you, you are God. Even though tonight you drop dead and the world thinks that now it's gone. That's just a little mark and it's rubbed out. Don't for one moment entertain it. You are immortal. You cannot die. You not only cannot die, you are the cause. You are the God spoken of in Scripture. You are the Lord God Jehovah. But you had to empty yourself to search for your son. And you came down into the world of death and took upon yourself the limitations of the human form and became obedient unto death, even death, upon this cross. That very cross on which your son was hanging on that tree. And you took the impression of it upon you. And you're going to raise, raise him up. And you will raise him up. But you will rise first. And when you rise first within your own skull, a few months later, an explosion takes place seemingly in the depths of your own being, all in your head. And when it all clears, he stands before you. And then memory returns, and here is your son that you knew in eternity. And you pledged yourself that you would redeem him. You will redeem him even though it took your life. For unless I die, you cannot live. But I will die and redeem you, even though you intended as a rebellious son to rub me up. And that is the love of God for his son. Told so beautifully in that 18th chapter of 2nd Samuel. It's the most poignant, the most touching story I think ever written. Love so great that even though the son has placed himself to destroy the father, the father so loves the son and inquires, is it well with the young man Absalom? And then that lovely way of telling you that the boy is dead. And then the servant, the Cushite answered, May the enemies 
of my Lord the King. And all who rise up against you for evil be like that young man. He needed no more to tell him his son was dead. And then he broke down and he wept and said, Oh, my son, my son, after them, would I have died instead of thee, my son? I once read a letter by Max Plowman, who wrote to a friend of his, both a great student of Blake, learning that his friend Rick said had lost his son. And when Rick said received the letter, his answer is priceless. But Max Talman's letter to Wickstead on receiving the knowledge or the news that he had lost his son, and he starts off the letter, I have nothing to say to him, for when the heart breaks, words make an empty sound. And then he goes in to quote this passage, and I will repeat with you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. But you can't beat it and not cry. Knowing it as I know it, and yet I can pick it up any night if I want to feel the mood of a tale, read that letter and try to restrain the tale. All based upon this 18th chapter of Second Samuel. It's one of the most touching pieces of literature in the world. So I ask the question, have you found it? Maybe at Philip, you can find it in the scripture. For to whom did he speak? He spoke to Nathaniel. Nathaniel means the gift of God. Then he says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Said Nathaniel. And then Jesus said, behold, an Israelite indeed. And when Nathaniel heard these words, he said, Master, you are son of God. He said, you say that because I knew you. But when did you know me? He said, I saw you sitting under the fig tree. Well, you would take that literally as some man sitting under a fig tree. No. In rabbinical literature, sitting under the fig tree is the perfect place, not a fig tree, this is the tree. That's the perfect place for the study of the Torah. So I saw you studying the Torah. And there you went through the Torah. And you're trying to find all that is talking about. For in the 40th Psalm, it is written of me. And there you're trying to find out who is this Messiah that is to come. For did he not anoint David? He anointed David, as we're told in the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel, and called him my son in the second psalm. And here you are studying, when is it going to happen? I saw you sitting under the fig tree. So here, Philip, who brought him, was studying the book. And here they discovered traces of his coming. So a man makes the claim that it happened to me. Well, you haven't found me because you've met a man in whom it happened. I tell you, it has happened to me. I have found David. And David has called me my Lord, my Father, and the rock of my salvation. But you can go out and say, I met a man who has had the experience recorded in Scripture concerning Jesus Christ. But his name is not Jesus Christ. His name happens to be Neville, a simple man with no educational, no financial, no social background, an ordinary man with the weaknesses and limitations of the flesh. Yet in him it has happened. So you can go and say, I have found him in whom the scriptures wrote, or of whom they wrote. But you really haven't found him. If you find me, you haven't found him. Because you have to find him only when you find the son. So you can find one in whom the son appeared and called him father, but you haven't found the son. When you find the son, you find yourself, because you are the father. So you can find a man, if you believe him, and you can trust him, and he tells you exactly what happened to him. And he will show you the passages of scripture related to his own experiences. And you will trust him implicitly and go out and say, I know a man in whom the story of Christ unfolded. But like Philip, you can say, I have found him in, of whom Moses, the law, and the prophets wrote. But then later on, you're going to say, show me the Father, if that's all that you know. Because you can't say you're from never. He is not the Father. The Father is in you, and the Son is in you, 
And when the son appears and calls you father, then and only then do you know the father. So no one knows who the son is except the father. And no one knows who the father is except the son. Therefore no man has ever seen God. But the only son who is in the bosom of the father, he has made him known. And so only when he comes out of your own bosom, your own head, and he explodes and stands before you, do you know the Son. And then and only then do you know the Father. Although you can trust me, and I hope you do, for I am telling you what I have experienced. I am not speculating. I am not theorizing. I never considered myself a scholar. So I never studied scripture from a scholarly point of view. I do not speak Sanskrit and Aramaic and Latin and all these terms, into which the very book was translated. I understand a little bit of Hebrew, enough to understand, but not to really carry on a conversation in Hebrew. And so I could never claim that I understand any of these sounds. And the only sound that I really know is English. And I would not consider myself a scholar in the, in the English tongue. I consider myself one capable of expressing myself as I have experienced certain things. I think the words will come that will be adequate to the experience that I can tell it as clearly as needed. Outside of that, I would never claim scholarship. So I trust that you will trust me in the truth of what I'm talking about. But you will not know the Father till you find the Son. And when you find the Son, you're going to find David. And David is going to reveal you as God the Father. And I'll tell you now, you are now God the Father. And you won't die because you can't die. You are the immortal God. But you die in the sense that you had to completely forget who you are to become man. And in this state, you are like an insane person because you have suffered and are suffering from total amnesia. But you will one day awaken and you will find David. And at that very moment, memory returns. And you know who you are, and you also know who everyone else in the world is. And while they're here in this world, they can all be used, and they are used as symbols in your dream. As I did with Stalin, the depths of my own being brought before me the tyrant of tyrants, the monster of monsters in the 20th century that I may so much to my own self see if I really can stand before such a monster and be unafraid. And here one who, is, who was a former premier, who is now unwell, but he stood and he knew the power of the man. He also knew how he criticized him after his death. He also knew how he took him out of the crypt that was an honored crypt and put him into a lower echelon. How he tried to dethrone him, and took all his taxes down. And now he changed the name of Stalingrad to Volgograd, and started a movement that cannot be stopped. And they're now bringing out a movement all over Russia to desalinize the area. They haven't succeeded, not yet. But he still, in the 20th century, will remain that symbol of all that is unlucky, all that is cruel. So he stood before me as judge. And because I had awakened from the dream, I was completely unmoved, for I knew that only pity possessed me. I knew that everything he wanted me to suffer, he himself would suffer. I wouldn't share it with him, I only had pity for him. So Blake was right in the divine image. Pity has a human face. Mercy is its heart, love is its body, and peace is his breath. And the only emotion that I felt as I stood before this monster, as he pronounced it, and the pain went through him, the eyes bulging with pain. And he got so angry he pronounced the second, and it was an intensified pain. And I stood there with only one emotion protecting me, the emotion of pity. Pity for one so blind, one so completely blind, he thought power rested in the destruction of millions, as he did it with impunity. When that is 
like a firecracker compared to the power that rests in God. And when he finds his son, he returns to that power. To stop time, at any moment in time, he stops it. And nothing can move. And he can change the motives of the thing that he stopped. And then when he releases that time, it moves in an entirely different direction. Change the motives of an individual, or a whole community, or the world. And they will simply awaken with a changed motive and not know what had happened. They will think that this is all what I always wanted to do, and they will simply fulfill his will. That power, you don't rub up anyone, don't change anyone. You simply stop time and change the motive of the things that are in time. And when you release the power, which you arrested not there, but within yourself, they were to change motive, continue, but not to fulfill their former intention, but the new one that you have now ordered. That's power. And that comes when you find who you are, and you find who you are only as you find the sun. For no one can tell me who I really am, but my son.